Um, so my name is Greg Baker, and I'm a do-it-yourself archery, um, actually bow hunter. And my hunting experiences has largely been in Eastern Oregon. And just to give some a few recognitions, one is to God, and then of course to the Jefferson Baptist Church Men's Ministry, and then a sponsor. Um, my sponsor is uh, Point Blank Hunting Calls. So also to my wife, and my wife's also a hunter. I started bow hunting, and she says, I want part of that. And so she has the bragging rights of killing the biggest bull in the family, or at least in my immediate family. That's a 333 bull, six by seven herd bull. And she's still hunting. She took an, actually uh, an, an archery antelope this year at Heart Mountain, thanks to Cliff Duke's uh, intel. We went over their preseason scouting. Um, so let's see, I'm clicking the wrong direction. So uh, Point Blank Hunting Calls used to um, be owned by Willie Rogers, um, currently owned um, by Jeremy, but originally it was Larry Jones Hunting Calls, and I'm familiar with those and I've used them since way back. And when I first started hunting in 1989, I was watching his videos, using his calls, and I still use them today. So here I am, this little guy here, my brother and my dad, and I've been uh, mentored by those that have hunted and gone before me, so um, it was just a family event. It's part of life, and so other than that, I've watched a lot of VHS stuff and seminars, but the thing is, is today is, is that we have everything online. YouTube, my gosh, you can go to a seminar. You can watch something right off the, off the uh, internet. You don't have to go anywhere right out of your front room, so it's really, really changed. Um, so recently, you know, a lot of the, the uh, YouTube stuff. Um, so my background, I've hunted elk for over 30 years. I made a lot of mistakes my first few years, and I think it's important for people to make mistakes because that's how you learn the best, is you get kicked in the gut, and you don't want that to happen again, and you learn from your own mistakes. Um, however, I kind of worked out my kinks, and I've killed a lot of elk, and a lot of them have been um, um, uh, uh, big bulls. And um, I think partly it's because I've just been fortunate enough to have the opportunity, but, um, but there's been times, a lot of times, where I didn't, wasn't trying to get a big bull, I was just trying to get an elk, and it, and it just happened. But also, as I've developed my hunting skills, I've been purposely trying to kill big bulls. Um, and all my hunting's been pretty much do-it-yourself on public lands and in Eastern Oregon. I have hunted in Arizona once, twice actually, and with somebody with, I was hunting with them, I didn't have the tag. So I've been down to Arizona three times, two tags of myself. I killed bulls down there. So part of this right here is not including that. So I've killed two bulls here. I killed also a bull in New Mexico. So if you've asked if I have ever hunted out of state, yeah, three times and I killed bulls. Um, two six by sixes and a five by five. Um, I hunt on the Cascades a little and not even recent. Given the new uh, uh, um, synopsis changes, uh, I probably will be hunting there more, obviously, because of the controlled hunting that they're requiring in Eastern Oregon now. Um, I have never hunted on the coast for elk, ever. Um, and that, I think that's going to change too. I think I'm going to go that direction. Um, so a little bit about myself. I'm a bow hunter. Uh, I am not an archer. I use a bow to kill. I don't like archery. You would think I would. Uh, but I'll tell you what, I like shooting my bow to have the effect of hunting elk during the rut. So um, I don't find enjoyment out of shooting my bow off season, for example, it's work. Um, some people are not like that, but that's how I am. I will, uh, so I'm a bow hunter, um, and I've killed a lot of different big game. Here's a real cool one, a, bill, a billy goat, um, some small game. I've done taxidermists because I was successful, it cost money, I wanted to do that, and I've done some public speaking, such as here. Um, been on ProSpath, been sponsored, some endorsements. Um, at my church, I've put on some contests and done some banquet stuff, which is kind of fun because it's my passion. That's what I like to do. Um, and then here, you know, is this, um, a calling championship. And I said, what do you want me for? I'm nobody. It's like, we've well, heard an elk bugle before, haven't you? You know what they sound like? Yeah, so come and judge. It's like, okay, thanks. <laughs> so that was a really cool opportunity. That's just a little bit about myself. So this is the bull I killed this year. I can go into the story on that later. Um, and uh, this was, uh, I didn't hunt last year because of COVID stuff. I didn't even hunt last year. Um, the year before that, I got this bull. And the year before that, I got this bull. So I've been killing some nice bulls le lately. Um, so if you're kind of like, oh, how many, like, you know, have you done it lately? Yeah, I've done it lately. I've killed every year I kill 
elk. Um, this has taken me back. You see a younger face here. Um, these are different elk. Um, these are different elk. This is when I was quite young. Um, this was Mount Emily um, on the right there. Um, got some out of state photos on the left. And then um, this is another bull. I use this call to kill that bull. And that's all I used, that one. Um, and then uh, it's a little bit of tree stand hunting. I killed those two bulls. I like to tree stand hunt, especially as it relates to new hunters. Maybe don't have the knees for it. Um, just preference and style, perhaps. Um, so I've killed more than just elk. And this is my daughter. And that's the, that's the, the deer right here, this buck. Um, so I want to talk some basics. If you guys are hunters, I, a little bit about the audience. You guys hunt, bow hunt? Starting, like, like novice or? Okay, you could probably be up here and speak as much as I, if you've done it as long as I have, you could probably come up here and say a lot of the same things as I'm going to say. Um, so just the three basics are smell, sight, and sound, and in the order as it relates to hunting elk specifically. If they smell you, forget it, game over, done. If they see you, ah, you know, they saw something, you might be able to get away with it. Uh, you'll never get away with an elk smelling you. You'll sometimes get away with sight and sound. Shoot, you can use that to your advantage, as long as it's not a slamming of a door, or talking out loud, stupid stuff like that. Um, so smell, yeah, keep yourself clean. Um, bears can smell uh, uh, better than an elk even. Um, so giving downwind you, is important. So keep the wind in your face. Uh, set up, when you're doing a setup, set up downwind. Watch the thermals, because if it gets swirly, you need to wait and come back later or just leave and get out of there. Um, so you never, never compromise your opportunity with hunting elk um, by, oh, I have that in there twice. Never compromise your hunt by a swirling wind comp, uh, you know, scenario. If you're hunting thermals, let's say in a canyon, you're gonna wanna hunt from uh, down up in the morning so you hunt up a draw, obviously the thermals are coming down. Uh, when the thermals change about mid-morning, you better change your tactic and approach and your direction of, uh, of going in after an animal, let's say, right? So you gotta watch your wind always. Um, tree stands and blinds, just set them up downwind. You'll have dominant wind direction and that's important. Um, my wife killed her big bull with perfumed Shampoo that I could smell from the distance from here to the back of the room. I was like, wow, be, you, you smell beautiful, but the elk will smell you too. And I like, what are you doing? And I went, uh, don't worry about it. Your tree stand set up downwind. <laughs> she got away with murder because you never, you, if they smell you, it's over. But she was downwind and she was sitting in a tree stand and she did fine. So wind is important. So scent control, cover scent, um, Rubbing poop on your shoes, elk poop. Um, using, listen, using, go to, a, go to a hunter's camp that has harvested and cut that patch off there that's all smelly and pack that around. That'll give you a good scent cover. And that's a little tip, a little secret. Um, we have harvested bulls, and guess what? The other bulls know what the other bulls smell like. They, they know what that other bull smells like. And if you grab that and go back in the same area, you could kill the other bull just because you've got good cover. Okay, that's a little trade secret right there. Um, wash. But listen, you can get away with a lot of this stuff if you're just downwind. If they, you don't have to shower and stink to high heaven as long as you're downwind, you're fine. So that's the smells, the don'ts. Um, elk want to see elk. Watch your movement, stay out of sight. Don't be caught in the open. Watch your silhouette. Um, here's some don'ts, okay? Um, Watch your outline. Um, have something to break you up, okay? Camouflage, by the way, I think is overkill, in my opinion. Uh, what you guys are wearing right now, you can kill elk in that if in the right scenario, okay? Because guess what? Movement, okay? As long as you're not silhouetted and you can break out your outline, um, not a problem, okay? Some do's. Um, yeah, you can use camo, but like I said, it's overstated. You can use an antler or a decoy. You can make sound to help uh, you, um, but that's not really sight, is it? But uh, if the tree's moving and they're like, oh, I heard a bull and I see that tree moving over there, it could bring curiosity. So just stay out of sight if you're wiggling on a tree or something. Use obstacles, stay in the cover, stay in the shade. Use a backdrop that's low in the front so you can shoot over it and then um, 
uh, just being, staying low, like being on your knees. If you can't stay in that position for a long time, at least kick stuff out from underneath you and stay still with the back over like a tree. As long as your elbow won't hit it when you're coming at full draw, you'll be fine. Um, you stay in a blind or a tree stand, that works well. But then again, you gotta watch your movement up there. Um, elk will, and deer, obviously will look at this level, but if you're moving too much, they will look up, and they have looked up even on me, but uh, you can get away a lot with just being elevated out of their line of sight. Um, so sounds, yeah, make noise, just as long as the right noise. Uh, don't use any unnatural sounds. Um, elk sounds are, they're very noisy animals. Okay, so you want to mimic those noises. Hooves, sticks, brush, raking on a tree. Uh, I've picked grass. I've dumped my precious drinking water out just to sound like I'm peeing, like an elk is peeing. Um, when they're super close, it's like, what am I gonna do? Pour the water out like an elk is, I mean, I, I grew up around cattle. I can hear when they're peeing. They can hear, you know, so you have to use, think about like, what are the natural sounds of an animal? So I will go to no end to try to figure out something that will work and build their curiosity, trick them, basically. Uh, splashing in the water, obviously calls, huge, but you can get away if you don't even know how to call. Um, but to use vocalization or calls is a very, very key component of killing and calling and killing an elk. Um, and there's a variation of those, they call, you know, uh, glunk, wheeze, cough, mew, belch. <coughs> that's no, that's no reed. That's, I can't buy that down at the store, but if you can do something like that, that bull, will, my brother's killed a 360 bull doing that. Um, but here's <coughs> external bugle, <coughs> external reed call. I use uh, mouth reeds and a variation of them, and I carry them in my pocket as I go. I have an, another one on my hip, so that if I'm about to draw, I can do something with my mouth and with my, my free hand to make a chorus of calls. Um, but sound like an elk, okay? All elk mew. They're often called cow calls, but not all calls are cow calls. There is elk calls. Okay, I've had big bulls do a mew or a cow call, and it was a big six by. And he came in and it sounded like a calf. I was like, wow, that threw me off. But um, barking, bugling, chuckling, gonking, growling, coughing, belching, um, just other sounds are natural, use them. And I'll use them all based on the scenario that I think might work for that occasion. Um, here's the rule of thumb though, whatever they hear, Usually an elk will hold up, and you've heard this happen time and time again. Oh, I called him at 80 yards, and he just stood there. What is he doing? He wants to see you. So that's when you have to build additional curiosity, and we'll talk about other scenarios. It'd be nice to have another caller to fade away. But, you know, There's different scenarios we'll talk about here coming up shortly, but a bull want, hears you. He wants to see you. A big bull is not tricked easily, okay? So... Uh, a young bull, that's why they're killed all the time. They'll come running in, three point, five point, you hoo I found a calf, a cow, you know, and it's all mine. And they come in and get shot. Not a six point, they're gonna come in a little bit more um, carefully, and they usually wanna size up competition because they wanna know who they're fighting, okay? If I was a prize fighter, I'd wanna study my video of the guy in the UFC fight and know how to throw my punch before I get there. That's what these bulls are doing. It's like, wait, if I'm gonna fight you, I wanna know, I wanna know who I'm fighting. So they do wanna see you. They just want to know that you're an elk and then how big you, bad you are. Um, if, if he doesn't see you, a lot of times they'll get nervous, they don't have confirmation, and then they'll leave. This scenario happens often, very often. So you have a very narrow window to close the deal when they come in because a bull will hang around, but not for long. So you better have a game plan going into it. So I'll talk with you guys about that a little bit. So some considerations for this year. All the Blues Mountains this year is all controlled. This has never happened before. It's kind of crept in originally with some of the premier units, you know, Mount Emily, Walla Walla, Jess Nimitz, and some of the northeastern units up here. There's Wenaha, uh, Ochico also, but now they've included the whole rest of the Blue Mountains. So this is going to really change the dynamics, but I'm going to give you some things that will help you even to have success, even after you pick one particular unit. Um, this is still open down here. The whole cascade's still open for general. And then you've got the coast, which is open with some certain controlled, uh, um, uh, you know, like bull only or something like that over at the coast. Um, so 
let's just get all of these up here. Okay, all right, so whether you hunt east or west, controlled versus general, cascade versus coast, or maybe in the southeast down in here where it's still open, you have, you have a choice now to figure out location. Um, you can use your points or you can use a top tier or kind of a secondary units. My, uh, the top three that I speak of is Mount Emily, Walla Walla, Winnaha. Um, they're secondary, they're really good, and guess what, they put them all under control, <laughs> okay? Um, but you get, if you want to use your points um, versus a general or a general, you know, this is something to consider for the new year coming, okay? Here's some pros and cons for you to consider. Uh, the, if within your, within your unit, let's say you picked, like I hunt Sylvie's, I've hunted different areas before, um, you know, pick a location within your unit. You, there might be variations in elevation that could affect the timing of rut and such, where the elk are, where the activity level is happening. Um, uh, choose the style of hunting. We'll talk about styles in a moment. Which time in the season, uh, whether you're early, or late, all of these will come in as a factor in how successful you might be in, in that particular unit. So some people will say, hey, I'm not after a trophy, I just want meat. Well, shoot, you have higher potential to draw certain units and go often versus, oh my gosh, Mount Emily, yeah, that'll take you forever to get a trophy. Um, physical abilities and other reasons, maybe there's remote versus what's more accessible, uh, public versus private. I've done private. I've never, I'm sorry, I misspoke. I've done public. I've never done private land pay hunts. Um, so my experience is everybody and their brother out on National Forest, it's free for all. And it's hard hunting, uh, but it's also more rewarding. Um, and then populated areas versus sparse areas, maybe some other considerations, like what's your physical ability? How much time do you have to hunt? What's your comfort level and or your hunting style as it relates to your hunt? So if you have certain preferences, you know, these are a consideration. Here's another one, solo versus party. Look how many guys we have. This was just a fun time. We came out, uh, he shot an elk. Um, so that was a really fun event. Some people says, no, I don't want the big crowd. I want to go by myself. So you might want to consider your preferences. Um, so the styles of hunting, um, I've killed elk all these styles. Um, um, and so my favorite is calling um, because you're vocal and it's super, that, that dialogue is super rewarding, super exciting. Um, spot and stalk, ambush. Uh, Amber's off of, uh, I've killed a lot off of a, of a tree stand, never out of a blind, but off of a tree stand, going to or at water, uh, going to or from feed on trails. And here's another one, on their escape route. So a lot of times when I know my area really well and what the elk's patterns are, they change when people come in and do things like bugle from the pickup truck to locate. It's like, oh, well, that, now the elk are educated, and they're going to do this, they're going to do that. And so I will hunt not just the elk. I'll hunt the elk according to what's happening as it relates to pressures from the other hunters. And so that's how I knew where to set my wife up to get her big bulls because it's like, oh, that bull was seen over here. A lot's going on over there. It's going to come through here next and set up here. She goes, no. It's like, set up here. Or I'll have your brother set up here. No. If you two don't have the common sense, I'll set up there. Okay, I will. She ends up getting that big bull. So um, have I done any guiding? Not officially. Have I helped friends and family? Yes. So that's really rewarding for me when I see my wife harvest or a friend harvest. It's really exciting for me to not just have the harvest for my, myself, but to enjoy the hunt part of it. Um, this year I killed mine almost on the wallow. I had a six by six that I kind of missed up on the opportunity. It was about one o'clock. I waited a few more hours, and then on my way back to the truck, I ended up killing the bull. But I have hunted off a wallow. Uh, I have not technically killed the one off of a wallow yet, but it almost happened this year because I typically don't really hunt wallows. Um, still hunting. So um, here's a scenario that happened a while back. And um, here is, this is my brother. And he killed a five by four, five up high on the mountain, different elevation, and calling and called it in. And it was a couple, two, three ranch, branch antler bulls, and he shot one. Um, I, I'll save mine for last because it's like stupid, crazy story. Um, this is my wife, and this is that big herd bull that I said, hey, sit up here. So I was just telling you about that. So she's on a trail. He's calling. And I'm up a tree like a cat that, that I was not even there before. I was helping a brother-in-law to be on a water hole. 
And it's like, where am I going to go? So I'll go to, I'll go to this one. What well, was dry? It was a dry water hole. It's like, okay. And I got there. It was late. I 20 minutes left in the day, what am I going to do? You know, I want to have some hunting opportunities. So you start to, you know, think, what's my, what's my possibility of hunting? I also had to go pee really bad. Well, where it was still a little bit of mud, but no water. I mean, not even a bird could drink. It's like, man, if I got to go pee, yeah, I might as well go pee there because all the cattle have been here and they're doing the same thing. So I went pee in one of the cattle's footprints. And then I'm like, I'll go sit up in that tree because what else am I going to do today? I don't have anything else to do. I was kind of facilitating another uh, brother-in-law's hunt and I didn't want to go too far from him because I had to pick him up at the end of the day and so I climb up this ponderosa tree about 15 20 feet and um, when I'm in a, a tree stand or any scenarios uh, I try to call and so I did some calling and I had this bull come in here and as a young bull it was a two by two but he came in and as he was sniffing at my pee I ran an arrow through him so elk um, he was curious about what that smell was. It's like crazy. How many people are telling you that? That's, I mean, that happened. Okay. So sometimes we have to think outside the box. Um, I, it was just maybe dumb luck, but it happened. Now I talked with my uncle back east. He does the same thing and saves up to his urine to go hunt whitetails. And he uses his own human urine for whitetail hunting. Interesting. I don't know if, what the deal is there. But here we have three different elk in the same area killed three different ways. Um, so depending on how you hunt them, you can be successful in a lot of different ways. Um, so listen, uh, uh, fitness is important, mental confidence, uh, knowledge of your species and familiarity, this is huge. Um, I give all credit to God, I ask him for my blessing before I go out hunting, and uh, whether you deserve it or not, sometimes he just gives you favor. I feel like he did me this year because I just like, I don't think I put in enough time to earn a bull like that, but it was just like, thank you, Lord. Sometimes that happens, so I really appreciate that. Um, put in your time ahead of time in scouting, um, using maps and such. Uh, I use Onyx right now, that's the big thing, but my wife likes this one for trails. GPS used to be, I, old time uh, use was the uh, BLM fire maps. Um, they had all the the, the trails and every detail of every potential road. I mean, so if you're in the area, it's like, man, I want an easy way to walk out. You know, those BLM fire maps are really, or to how to get into an area. Those old BLM fire maps, guess what? Well, not all the trails that are on, on Onyx. So I will still use those old fire maps and maybe something more current. Uh, I'll talk with biologists, other hunters, um, for, for not about elk, but this year about archery hunting uh, antelope in at Heart Mountain, uh, I talked with a previous hunter, um, Cliff Duke. He hunted down there, him and his wife, and I talked with him. I called the biologist. Uh, I talked with the locals. I talked with the guide there. Um, I went out and made my personal observations. I did all of these things, so it doesn't have to apply to elk as that, the specific species of elk. It can apply to any animal, right? So why I did all this, and I don't have a picture of my wife's antelope, but she got a nice antelope out of Park Mountain this year. So um, I'm a little, I'm a skeptic by nature, and I like familiarity. So anything new is, uh, it's like I kind of wait a little while. This is something I waited too long on. Cameras, oh my gosh. They will give you information when you're not there. Use them. Um, I have several cameras. I use them now, and it's, it's, I felt like it was cheating. <laughs> it's not against the law. It's just <laughs> it helps out. Um, so uh, just be in the field. Um, so shed hunting. You know, you get to see if it's dead or if it's shed, if it's still there. If it hasn't harvested, you're going to find either this or this, you know, and so you kind of know what you're going to be hunting the following year. Here's the thing. You can, spend, you can hunt smart, um, but you also have to hunt hard, okay? Um, so uh, scout, be persistent, and also when you're hunting, be patient. I don't like to go back to camp in the middle of the day. It's convenient, but you're not hearing what's going on. Uh, the six-point bull that I was on at the Wallow bugled at, uh, 12, bugled at 12 o'clock. He came into the Wallow at 1 o'clock. I messed it up. Um, but that's just being in being persistence and, and have perseverance pushing through, not just day by day, but all week long. So um, 
So I hunt from early on, I hunt all day, and I go all week, okay? There's been many, many, many times where you get it on the last day. It's like you push that hump day, Wednesday, so hard you don't want to get out of bed, but you just keep going. So here's the litmus test. If you're at camp in the middle of the day, you're not spending enough time in the woods. That's my opinion. Now, listen, I'm getting old and I like the camper and I like going out for the cheeseburger in the middle of the day, and I've done that. But if you want to, if you've got to hunt smart and you've got to put your time in, um, especially when you're hunting in, uh, you know, if you want to have harvest, you've you got to, you got to, you got to um, put your time in. Okay. Um, finding a bull. Um, I use a locator bull and I add in some cow calls. Um, I like to call at night. Um, I will call in the middle of the day. Isn't that crazy? Like the middle of the day? Yeah. But if that's during the rut, right? Not pre rut. Um, and they will be in their bedding areas. Um, Vary your calls, use different calls, because we have different voices, and I can recognize who calls me on the phone. If you go in an area and mess up on an elk, go in with a different voice, because he's educated a little bit now. Maybe he'll think, you know, change it up a little bit. Uh, try to build excitement in them. Uh, find out what triggers them. Build their curiosity, and change your timing and your tempo, and really listen to what that elk is doing, and try to mimic, and try to build that excitement in him, okay? Um, so, calling, um, yeah, so, sorry. Change your voice, change your intensity, timing of it, do what the elk are doing, and do what works and what they're responding to. Test them, try them. And so that, every elk's a little bit different, every season's a little different. Um, you might be billing, dealing with a big herd bull, you might be dealing with a young one, um, you might be able to call in a cow elk if you're trying to get that. All that needs is just a cow, and um, it's a little bit simpler calling in a cow. Um, so read your bull. Is he in rut? Is he, is he there? Was he there? How, you know? Um, so some things that you look at is if you're looking for a specific age of an animal, uh, how experienced or educated is that animal? Uh, what's the exposures? Is there hunting pressure? Is there cougars in the area? I've had change of hunting scenarios because of, guess what? Cougars were there, elk were not. Uh, hunters were there, elk were not. Uh, timing of the rut. Uh, there's personality differences, I believe, in people. Also, I think, in animals. I've been around a animals before, you know, domestic animals, and they do have different personalities. Some are lovers, not fighters. Others, they, they are, are scaredy cats. Um, so, um, some peas. Just <laughs> read through the list. A lot of variables to consider. I'm going to flip through this because I don't want to take a lot of time. When to call. I call often. Okay? If I'm still hunting, if I'm in a stand. Not frequent, but I mean in every scenario I will call. If I'm still hunting, I'll, put a, I'll throw out a cowl once in a while. If I'm on a stand, maybe it's a half an hour, 45 minutes, I'll set one. Um, during your setup, um, keep vocal, build, build excitement. And after you shoot them, or, or when you're about to stop them for a shot, I will, I will send out a call. That's a double-edged sword right there, double-edged sword right there, because sometimes when you try to stop them, you'll spook them. So be careful about that one. But I definitely always call after my shot to try to calm them down so they're not running off. Especially if they don't know that it's you that shot them and they're like, what was that? And I'll try to calm them down. So um, this is probably where an experienced hunter really wants to spend his time, okay? All of that 80% of conversation was for the newbie. This um, is more for the experienced guys. Okay, why do I run the scenarios? Now, if you go elk University Elk Hunting 101, you're going to run, they have a lot of scenarios. There's a lot of videos that are out there uh, that will talk about um, what, how, how they have run their scenarios and they nickname them. Um, slingshot, you know, like that was from, uh, uh, what was the name of the group? I can't, that, they'll nickname them. There's, these are my nicknames. I call it a fadeaway, okay? If you have a bull, and he comes in and he's curious, most people don't leave the bull. True? Why would you leave the bull? You just got him to you. 
But if the bull hangs up at 80 yards, what are you going to do? Go up there and sit in his lap? It ain't going to work. So I will sometimes fade away, call away, call at a distance, or pull back to try to get him to continue to foul. Elk move, by the way, and they talk while they move, right? Coming and going from bedding to feeding and such. And that's a lot of times when they're why they're vocal, because early in the morning, early in the evening, that's what they do, and they're vocal. And the cow's calves get separated, the bull's trying to keep it all together, but when they bed down, they're kind of quiet, right? So if they're moving and stuff, you are not moving, it alerts an elk that expects the herd to be moving. So if you are in one spot and keep calling, that's a problem. So we try to fade away, or we will try to move forward, what I call leap, link, uh, leapfrog. I'll have my shooter up front, I'll call in the back. And then when he gives me a three call signal, I'll move up to him and he will move up farther. And that's what I call leapfrog. It's just the nickname that I called it. Um, when they're in a frenzy, when they're in full rut, my gosh, just run in and shoot them. It is a chaos when you got two, three bulls bugling, you can get away from the murder, okay? Well, if they're fighting, they're, they're locked horns, just walk up 25 yards and shoot them broadside. My brother did that down in Arizona. Um, give them the silent treatment. So listen, elk don't have a time schedule. They don't have to, have to be back at camp or as a hunting buddy or at work the next day. They don't wanna, they live out there. So if you try to put time on, on part of your setup as a factor, you gotta be careful because um, uh, you, you'll, you'll not be patient when you need to be patient. So if, um, if it's approaching midday, let's say it's 10, 30, 11 o'clock, and you have a bull, well, you don't wanna leave the bull. He doesn't wanna even, he wants to bed down. He just wants to gather up with the other local elk. So if he's there and you know he's there, but he's not coming in, you have to be really, really patient sometimes. Sit down, have a snack for a half hour, 45, and be totally silent and give him the silent treatment. I've done this where I've sat there for an hour having a, a break because I'm tired and I'm hungry and I'm eating, and then the bull bugles, he's not even 100, he didn't even move. He was, wasn't even 100 yards away, he was still there. So be, be careful because uh, sometimes you'll pass up bulls and it's okay to pass up a bull that's not interested for one that is, but I'm just saying that if you have a bull there, maybe just give him the silent treat and let him try to kind of find you. Marco Polo, you know, let him try to kind of find you. Um, ambushing um, them on the move, you know, flanking them or other styles. Um, so flanking or surrounding them, uh, splitting the bull from his cows, oh my gosh. That'll kill you. Uh, uh, that's, that's how you kill a herd bull. Um, but it's really hard to slip in the middle, okay? Um, and then uh, remote calling. A story there. That works extremely well because you can keep them vocal at a distance and the hunter can go in silent and maneuver on that bull that's vocal, not knowing that you're there, okay? This is where, uh, this worked really well in Mount Emily, when I had my brother bugle from the road and kept a bull bu actively bugling engaged, and I just moved in on that bull, and it was about till 11 o'clock, and my bull brother is still bugling on the road. And if anybody would have walked, by, walked or drove by him, and me included, I would have thought, what an idiot. He's bugling from the road. It's 10:30, 11 o'clock. What are you doing? What he was doing is he was keeping my bull vocally active so that I could continue to slowly maneuver in on there. Now the bull went from full bugles and every growl and thing you can think of to just like <laughs> like at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, he was still there. And so I was moving, it was a big seven by seven and I missed my shot. Um, but remote calling works really good, okay? Um, so other tactics, um, sound like a cow, obviously bulls want cows. Um, challenge this, you know, challenging, um, be, sound like a satellite bull, um, don't sound like the biggest bull in the woods. Um, so setting up, um, here's some key points, just read through those on your own. But your setup is really important. Um, if you do it wrong, you'll have failure. And if you do it right, you'll have success. And here's some things that you just need to consider. So take a look at that. Um, lot to think about, but basically you be, need to be able to get your shot off, bottom line. Um, an elk wants to see an elk. Um, an elk wants 
to be around other elk. So think like an elk and act like an elk and you will see the elk. So they want these things. They want to be safe, secure, secluded. They want food and water and shelter. They, they are a herd animal. They're social. Uh, if they're in a rut, they want cows. Um, so be versatile. Um, move locations. Now here's where it starts to uh, play in a little bit as it relates to hunting in a particular unit because I have moved from unit to unit before and now if you're in a controlled area you have to stay within that unit bounds but still even within your unit and if you know your unit you can move within your unit. Um, so change your style based on where you're at and your location, maybe your approach. Uh, don't get into a pattern unless it works. Do what works, but be careful you don't get stuck in a pattern because, and be persistent if you know the pattern and you know that it works. The worst thing that guys do is they do things that have failed before, they continue to do them not trying anything else. Okay? This bull down here is an example. Okay? I was out three days. The first day I ran into elk and located them. The second day we ran into hunters and the elk were people scared, bugle advised, <laughs> and, we, I, and they were shy. The third day I found wallows and sat there all day. And so I had to figure out and change my pattern of hunting, my approach and my style. And that's why I killed the bull, is because I sat there all stinking day knowing that that's where the bull is going to eventually end up. And so I don't like sometimes staying in one spot all day, but that's what I needed to do to have the harvest. Um, so if you have a pattern and it works, but don't get into a pattern that doesn't work. Uh, don't be afraid to try different things. Oh, this slide. This is the only slide that I have of, a, of an elk that's not mine uh, or my wife's. Let's see, this is a buddy's elk, and it's d with a rifle that he borrowed of my wife's that was ours. And I got this bull to bugle during rifle season, jump that fence, this is all huntable, but it, I caught him out of a thick area and he bugled and came in during rifle season. So calling really works for elk, period. Archery and rifle. Every rifle hunter should be buying calls and using them. I got this bull to bugle during rifle season. I mean, it's like, that's awesome. Um, so don't be afraid to try different things. Okay, here's a couple secrets of killing a bull. So we talked about being versatile. We talked about my little secret of having a proper scent, even a local one that bulls may have smelled before and recognized. But here's another different one. I don't ask people, hey, where's the elk? Because guess what? They're hunting them too and they're not going to tell you. If they tell you they're really nice or they're stupid because they're going to add competition or <laughs> or they're lying to you because they want you to go the other direction. So a lot of times I will ask them not so much where the elk are, but where they've been hearing coyotes. Coyotes will f f trail and follow the elk because they're a predator. Everybody will tell you about a coyote that they heard uh, yipping, but they won't tell you where they've heard an elk bugling. So right here is a little trade secret of just talking with people, your competition. It's like, hey, have you heard any coyotes? Oh yeah, way over there, three, four. Any heard it? Have you heard any? Over? No. I'm going there for hunting elk. Does that make sense? That's a little secret. Um, so you need to go where the elk are. Um, and if you're hunting big bulls, you need to uh, get lucky, find them on trail cam, scout them out, but know where they are. If you're hunting, if you're hunting, wanting to kill a big bull, you know, you're going to have to know he's there in order to hunt them, right? So I don't like to go where people aren't. The caveat is, is that people are hunting elk continue to hunt those elk. So if you see a lot of pickups in an area, you're thinking there's got to be elk there. So I will sometimes go where all the pickups are, but then try to get away from the hunters where all the, where the elk are. Another, so Jay Scott, Arizona, for example, he says, if you see a pile of pickups in an area, he says, you know there's a monster bull down there because that's everybody's hunting them, right? He says, normally you would go away from where the pickups are. He says, down there, you're going to want to stay where the pickups are. Okay, does that make sense? So, but I don't like to hunt around people because I want to hunt a bull that's unaffected by the pressure, but sometimes you've got to go where the elk are. If you're not finding elk, you've got to go where the elk are. Guess what? That's where all the other hunters are as well. Um, so you can hunt for a known bull if you know what it is. Um, certain pockets are producers. Anybody that's a fisherman will know that they'll go back and fish in the same little 
stream pocket because guess what? The fish are coming through. So if you kill a bull in an area, guess what? Uh, the big bulls that you kill out are going to be replaced by the smaller bulls coming in the next year. So you can go back and have continued success year after year. This is another hunt that I was on. It's an Arizona bull. That's not my bull. Um, this, is a, uh, this is a bull that's uh, over 400. Um, but in Oregon, by way, a trophy bull, in my opinion, is a bull that's over 300. So if you have a five and a half year old bull and he's over 300 in Oregon, you're doing good, okay? Um, most people are lucky when they just get stuff, uh, but I would say make your mistakes, learn from your mistakes, but if you don't have mistakes, you, uh, you're, you, I was like, you make, them, make them all and get them over with. Then, you, then you'll learn faster. I made five years of mistakes when I first started everything under the sun. It's like, I'm not doing that no more, including wounding animals, which a lot of people won't talk about. But I got so sick of, you know, the equipment. Years and years ago, the equipment wasn't as good. Um, you know, I didn't have a range finder, um, you know, and I would shoot at the wrong time. I was learning, making lots of mistakes. And I thought, Baker, you know, put your, kill it or put your bow down, you know. And so now I shoot, 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 up to 100 yards I shoot. And I want to shoot paper plate. And when I'm shooting 100, it makes me feel like I can shoot great at half the distance. So I shoot and a lot because I don't want to make the mistake of having bad arrow placement. Um, and there's a lot of other mistakes that you can make too. Um, but uh, listen, my first elk was a calf elk and I was elated. Okay, um, it was at 10 feet. I was so excited. But you know what? I didn't start out killing big ones. I started out making lots of mistakes and killing some small ones and then started passing up fun, uh, some uh, smaller ones. But you know, find one. You don't have to kill a bull to have successful hunting and put meat in the freezer. Uh, so, but just find one and hunt one. Um, so here's some key elements in my success. I pray to God for his blessing. Okay, because I can spin and put my tires and put a lot of effort out. And um, I'm, I'm, God's not a sugar daddy, but he's our daddy. And he made the animals, he made us and everything on earth. And I know where my blessing comes from. So I just ask him to bless me. It's a conversation I have. And uh, I just want to give God the glory, literally. I want to give him the credit because everything I am and everything I've done, my talents, my skills, my successes, my failures, and everything, it, I just want to praise God for uh, the, having the opportunity, and I want to take this opportunity to recognize him. So thank you, Lord. Um, but you've got to put your time in, um, and you be persistent. Be familiar with your hunting area. We talked about that. So here's some key successes, uh, key elements to my success. Blessing, put my time in, uh, become familiar, and your personal hunting skills. Um, have an intimate knowledge of your quarry. There's a lot of depth to this right here, because I know elk really well. I feel very confident that I can go into an area and have success. It's because I know how elk think. I hunted a new area I'd never been to ever before, and I was on elk within a day or two, and had shot opportunities and engagements and success. So um, that's it. That's all that I have today. Um, there's a lot more to talk about, like how to call or other scenarios. And um, there's just not enough time for one hour of conversation. So um, one thing before I open it up to some questions is, is that this is typically how I look. I carry a bugle. I carry my range finder. It usually goes in the pocket. I usually have a couple calls. I have my pack and I have my bow. And um, I would be dressed in camel. I don't use face paint. I don't know, use a face shield or anything, but uh, I use a release. But this is my equipment. This is, if you were to see me in the woods, this is pretty much how you'd see me other than just in some camel. Okay, does anybody have any questions? Yeah, are you out here at the show? In the booth or? Uh, yeah, I did set up at a booth earlier, and after this, um, I can go back out, or we can just have continued conversation here. I do have... I have a booth myself, so that's why I was going to get back and I'd like to talk to you more about it. Sure, I, yeah, sure, you bet. I'll, I'll swing by there a little later, but I need to get back to the booth. Um, I think I've seen where your booth was. Maybe I'll just stop by yours if, you, if okay. that's all right. Yeah. Okay.
Perfect. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? I know it all, Greg. You what? <laughs> I know it all. You know it all. I, I, you know, Cliff, I asked you to, to uh, ask me some really tough questions. You like using your uh, quiver, uh, your uh, vein cutter? Okay, yeah, so um, I like to see what I'm shooting and I'll use um, white. Yeah. Um, it's harder to see in the fall colors, like sometimes green or orange, so I like white. Um, and, but it's glaring, and, and, and white in movement is uh, easy to see, right? So this is a makeshift vein cover, um, <clears throat> and it won't mess up um, the, the knocks if it gets in mud or dirt or something, and it just protects it a little bit more, too, also from dust and stuff. Do you use knocks? I, I tried some in practice, but I don't use them in hunting. <clears throat> um, I thought about it, and um, there's a little switch on it, and I'm not a ga Mr. Gadget, and I didn't feel like it was that helpful in uh, following up with game kills or tracking or trailing. To I didn't feel like it added a lot, because I can see where my arrow hits because it's white. I don't feel like I need it illuminated. Some people's like, oh, I, I seen because it was illuminated where my arrow hit. But a lot of times I'm noticing that those illuminated knocks are on darker colored veins. So I have a light colored vein and a little added dipping or wrapping that's white so I can actually see where my arrow hits, which is nice. This year I could see my arrow go right through this bowl and it wasn't illuminated. It was in the evening about five o'clock. Yeah. You know, we didn't talk about equipment, but there's a lot to talk about as far as calls and those things and equipment and such, but okay. Thank you much.